Good evening, my name is Roxanne from RBC Consultants. Welcome to another International Dermatology Education Foundation Educational Series webinar. We're sorry for the small delay that we had, but we've had so many registrants this evening that we were just letting them in. So this evening, we are going to be talking about vitiligo, but from a patient journey perspective. So it should be a quite of an interesting evening. And this activity is jointly provided by Medical Education Resources and the International Dermatology Education Foundation. And this activity is supported by an educational grant from Insight Dermatology. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Leon Kursik, who is the president of the International Dermatology Education Foundation. Clinical Professor of Dermatology at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, Indiana University Medical Center in Indianapolis, Medical Director of Physician Skin Care, Derm Research and Skin Sciences in Louisville, Kentucky. And our speaker this evening is Dr. Samal Desai, who is Clinical Assistant Professor of Dermatology at the University of Texas Southwestern, and founder and medical director of Innovative Dermatology, PA. Again, we would like to thank Insight Dermatology for making this educational event possible. Before we begin, a couple of logistic tips. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having technical issues or if you'd like to ask a question from our faculty, please submit your questions in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your browser and will be emailed to you within one to two days. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could fill it in and send it back to us. And within one to two days of the webinar, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you. Again, if you'd like to submit your questions, please submit them in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. And I wrote a little note there that uh, you can see where you need to type in your questions. The target audience of this evening is a, an activity that's been designed to meet the educational needs of dermatology healthcare professionals involved in the care of patients with vitiligo. And there's a knowledge gap among the healthcare professionals on how to treat a top, uh, vitiligo among their skin of color patients. The joint accreditation in supporting of improving patient care, this activity has been planned and implemented by Medical Education Resources and International Dermatology Education Foundation. MER is jointly accredited by the Accreditation Council of Continuing Medical Education, the Accreditation of Council of Pharmacy Education and the American Nurses Accreditation Center to provide continuing education for healthcare teams. Disclosure of conflicts. In terms of the disclosure of conflicts of interest, medical resources ensures a balance, independent, objective, and scientific rigor. And in accordance with the policy of MER, identifies conflicts of interest with the instructors and content other individuals who are in position to control the content. So the conflict of interest this evening for Dr. Kursik and Samal Desai is displayed here. and also for the managers. A certificate will be issued upon completion of an evaluation survey and credits must be claimed by April 1st, 2023. This link will be emailed to you within one to two days of the webinar. And if you have any questions about the activities, please contact Medical Education Resources at the number displayed or jsykes at cmepartner.org. So without further ado, I will pass the floor virtually to Dr. Kursik. Thank you, Roxanne, and good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Desai, welcome. I am very happy uh, today um, that we have Dr. Desai as our guest uh, speaker on the Tuligo. Next slide, please. So, just a couple of words about IDEF, International Dermatology Education Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose principal mission is to raise awareness 
and improve dermatology care all over the world through education, especially in underserved areas. And we have done, next slide please, we have done several programs, both in North America, Canada, US, as well as globally across the world, all the way from Latin America to Southeast Asia. Uh, and tonight, next slide please. Tonight we have Dr. Desai, uh, and we're gonna start from polling question number one. Uh, prior to 2022, there were no FDA approved treatments for any form of vitiligo. Go ahead and please select one. Okay, 82% said that is true, and we're gonna find the answer very, very soon because we're gonna repeat those questions again at the end, so remember. And let's move on to the second question. Which of the following types of vitiligo morphology is considered to be active uh, and unstable? Please select one. Perfect, so this is a divided answer here, confetti vitiligo versus segmental. All right, so let's move on and let's find out the answers. I'm very proud and happy to present Dr. Simal Desai, who does not need any introduction, who's gonna be our next, uh, still for the next week, until next week, still the elect uh, AAD president, our next uh, LFA, as I would say. Welcome, Simal. Thank you for joining us. Please take it over. You're still you muted, Dr. Tasai. Thank you very much for unmuting me. And thank you very much, Dr. Kursik, for the invitation. I'm Simal Desai. I am the founder and medical director of Innovative Dermatology in Dallas, Texas, and also on the clinical faculty at UT Southwestern. And as Dr. Kursik mentioned, I'm the incoming president-elect of the American Academy of Dermatology. Uh, but however, I'm presenting tonight on behalf of myself and my clinical expertise and practice in the area of vitiligo and not on behalf of any organization. And I'm very pleased that IDEF invited me to share some time with you this evening. I'm sure like many of you, you're coming straight from clinics, seeing patients, uh, as am I. And I was looking forward to this session all day uh, and, and ending my day of a challenging day in clinic, at least interacting virtually with many of you, my colleagues. I'm gonna proceed in the next few minutes going through a variety of different scenarios and some pearls from my vitiligo practice really focusing on the patient experience in vitiligo, which I think is so important. And if I could have the next slide or slide control, please. So you should be able to have slide control, Dr. Desai. Let me know, just click in the middle of the screen there. There you go. Perfect. So just to mention, the this is my affiliation. And for those of you who are social media savvy and would like to reach out over Social media, feel free to follow along on Twitter or Instagram at Samal Ardesai MD. These are my disclosures. As mentioned, I do perform clinical research in the area of vitiligo along with several of my colleagues throughout the US and internationally. I do serve in a variety of leadership roles. Again, my leadership roles do have nothing to do with tonight's presentation. I'm also a member of the US Food and Drug Administration's Pharmacy Compounding Advisory Committee. So I do have to disclose that. However, my FDA governmental roles will not interfere with today's talk. Now, when we talk about vitiligo and the patient experience, I think one of the most important things we need to be able to do is to start by really framing how we discuss vitiligo as a disease to our patients in our practice. And one of the things I share with patients when they come into the clinic is to let them know that vitiligo is not a rare condition and they are not alone in having vitiligo. In fact, if you look at recent studies, 
the prevalence of vitiligo ranges from anywhere between one in 250 to one in 50 individuals. It's not a rare disease. It's not something that you'll only ever see one case of in your entire career. As a dermatologist, you are bound to see cases of vitiligo and maybe multiple cases of vitiligo in your clinical practice. I also tell my patients that it doesn't matter if you're male or female or what age you are. Vitiligo can happen at any age and in any gender. In fact, there's a fairly equal predilection for either gender and that over half of the patients we see, almost 50 to 55%, depending on which reference you cite, can show signs of depigmentation early in their life before the age of 20. One of the important aspects of framing the discussion with the patient and how to describe this disease is to really understand that the disease is associated with a variety of psychological conditions, oftentimes with concomitant major depressive disease and other psychosomatic illnesses that these patients do suffer. And this is, by the way, common, not just the affected patient, but we have seen this also in families and in cohorts because this is a disease that has lots of stigma, especially in patients from a, a different cultural backgrounds such, such as Southeast Asian, Latin, or even African. Now, one of the other ways that I approach vitiligo and really try to make the patient experience as meaningful as possible because many of these patients, by the time they come to see me in my practice, have either been referred from another dermatologist or have done extensive research online, have tried multiple therapies. I always try to flip the script and call it, what is the bright side? Yes, you have vitiligo. Yes, there is depigmentation. Yes, this is very traumatic and traumatizing, but what's the bright side of having vitiligo? Well, the one bright side of having vitiligo, and I tell every patient this, is that guess what? You may have vitiligo, but you have a threefold less risk of developing melanoma compared to the general population. And so trying to find something to allow that patient to view their disease as glass half full versus glass half empty, I think is very, very important. I also mentioned that having vitiligo on the face is fabulous. And some of these patients look at me like I'm nuts and they say, oh, I've come all this way to see you. I've flown into Dallas, I've come to your office and now you're telling me that I have vitiligo on my face and that's fabulous to have that disease on your face. Well, the reason it's fabulous is because from a therapeutic perspective, head and neck vitiligo is the type of disease that actually will respond to therapy faster and better than other parts of the body. In fact, I tell patients, if you listen to what I say, 80 to 90% of your facial lesions can fully repigment depending on the sort of aggressivity of the treatment that's done within potentially a 12 to 24 month period, maybe even sooner. So facial disease gets better. It's fabulous to have predominantly facial involvement. And these patients are at less risk of developing melanoma compared to the general population. That doesn't mean you won't get melanoma in a vitiligo patient, but there's a lower risk. Now, what are our treatment options? And in terms of the patient experience, I think we really have to talk about all of the different treatment options available in our therapeutic armamentarium. Everything from using off-label topical steroids, calcineurin inhibitors, vitamin D analogs, all of the things that you've all probably tried, systemic treatment, phototherapy, a huge part of my practice, which we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, and then moving on even to surgical therapy and don't forget psychological therapy, which is very, very important because many of my patients I do co-manage with a psychiatrist or a clinical therapist, especially if they're suffering from depressive disease or from other psychological illnesses because of the trauma, the social stigma, the really deep, profound impact that this has, particularly in patients of color. And I think it's always important to recognize that no matter what you're doing for your patient, always Think about what the patient wants. I've had many people who come in and say, you know what, I'm not really bothered by any part of my body except my face. I've also had some people come in and say, I'm not bothered by any part of my vitiligo and they have it all over except their genital area, believe it or not. And, and you'd say, well, why does that bother you? Well, you know, patients have different psychological impact on body parts affected by this disease. So ask the patient, where does it bother you the most? Does it bother you? How aggressive do you want me to be? Do you want to try to achieve full repigmentation? Do you want me to partially help?
Do you just want to know your options and think about it? And I've seen it all. So don't assume that every patient wants the same therapeutic outcome with their vitiligo. This is a very individualized disease. Now, it's important from a patient experience perspective to try and define the level of active unstable vitiligo. Now, unstable vitiligo and active vitiligo can appear in a variety of different ways. One way is to really ask the patient how many areas of depigmentation or whitening have you noticed in the preceding six to eight week period that you've had the depigmentation? And if they say I've had, you know, one patch on my neck and one on my cheek, one on my arm, one on my leg, one on my thigh, and you sort of quantify that and it fits into, you know, their own 1% VSA, the palm of their hand in a six to eight week period, I would consider that active unstable. That's sort of a rough estimate that some of my vitiligo colleagues and I use. The vast majority of patients that you'll see are in the chronic phase where the depigmentation is present for at least one year with no history of spontaneous repigmentation. And then you'll have a subset of patients that no matter what you do have refractory disease that's just you know, really poorly responding to therapy. Now that's important because active unstable disease must be stabilized. So anytime I see a patient come in with multiple patches in a, in, a, in a fairly short period of time, or patients who have confetti vitiligo, or trichrome vitiligo. Those are all examples of active unstable disease. And those patients require oral mini pulse systemic steroid therapy with four milligrams of dexamethasone on two consecutive days per week, such as a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning. And I usually do this for six to eight weekends and counsel the patients on side effects of systemic steroids. I also, in, in some younger adolescents, half the dose to two milligrams, and this can be used to help stabilize the disease. Now, I wanted to just take a moment and really come back to the patient experience about the psychological impact. And this happens to be a beautiful painting that I actually took a picture of when, when visiting the Colonial Williamsburg Museum of Revolutionary Century Art in Williamsburg, Virginia. Those of you who've ever been there, it's a beautiful museum. I was there with my wife and children for the North Carolina Dermatology Society meeting, and we had a break in the sessions and we walked to the museum. And you walk into the museum, and this was the first painting I saw. And this painting is fascinating because if you look at the inscription, this was a painting from the 1700s of a young girl who was suffering from vitiligo who back in the 1700s, the doctors had no clue what it was and said, you know, is this some sort of speciating superiority phenomenon? Is this a racial phenomenon? Um, there were a variety of different thoughts and, and, and issues associated with this. And you can imagine that a young girl in the 1700s who looks like this is clearly going to be stigmatized and ostracized from her community. And when we fast forward to the year 2023, I can tell you that in many parts of the world, this is still out there. Vitiligo is still a stigmatizing disease. So a young girl like this, who's suffering from vitiligo, who had a painting done in the 1700s about her, if she, this girl is in certain parts of the world in certain cultures now, this young child is also going to probably be discriminated and ostracized and is going to feel very, very self-conscious, both her and her family. Now, let's talk a little bit also about antioxidants in vitiligo because I do use antioxidants frequently. I use polypodium leucotomus, usually 240 milligrams, two capsules every morning. And studies have shown that this improves the rates of repigmentation and improves the rates of outcomes with repigmentation with patients with vitiligo. This happens to be a study that was published in the JEADV showing 250 milligram dosing. I like the proprietary blend that we have mostly available here in the US with the fern block technology. And I'm simply mentioning that because there is no generic of that. Uh, and I have been involved in clinical research with that. So that's my conflict. But I think that looking at pure phenomena of formulations is very, very important. I also use alpha lipoic acid with vitamin E and vitamin C. I use this in combination with phototherapy. And there's been a number of studies that support the use of antioxidants, especially in combination with narrow band UVB. Typically, alpha lipoic acid with vitamin C and vitamin E works very, very nicely. This happens to be a 100 milligram dosing that has been used, and I use this as well 
in patients, particularly those with phototherapy. Now, one of the important things about patient experience, again, is to give the patient little nuggets, little sound bites. And one thing that always comes up is the, the really deep concern that many patients have about family history and family risk. And, you know, yes, you may have vitiligo, but is the family going to get it? Is the, uh, you, you have, if one child has it, is another child going to get it? All of these things are very rampant and very concerning. And I say, guess what? You have one child who has it, that's okay. And there is only about a 6% chance of you passing this to another child. So the, the, when one patient is the only one in the family affected, the risk to develop vitiligo for the children is really below 10%. I also mentioned that patients who come in with the real strong desire to repigment their skin and, and do really well with repigmentation, these patients are the ones who have invested time in topicals and in phototherapy and in antioxidants but they get worried about relapse. And relapse is not uncommon. It's about 40% of the time that a lesion that fully repigments will re-depigment. But you can reduce that relapse rate uh, by using something that I'm gonna mention in just a minute. So I'm gonna come back to that and save that little tidbit of pearl. But one thing that I do wanna share is there's lots of new things on the horizon. So part of the patient experience is particularly to give these patients hope. Well, we have the JAK inhibitors, which have been amazing and have revolutionized our therapy that have become FDA approved in 2022. And now we have studies that have shown that if you can use blockade of IL-15 signaling, that potentially you can durably reverse vitiligo. And what's fascinating is we have biologics for psoriasis, we have IL-23 and 17 blockers and, and 12, and then we have IL-4 blockers and AD, and we have all these biologics. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have an IL-15 injectable biologic for vitiligo that re reversibly and durably reverses this disease? And we think that IL-15 signaling may be the key to that. Now, in the last few minutes before we open it up for Q&A and questions and answers, which I'm excited to take from the audience tonight, I know we have a, a really large group joining us, which I'm so thankful that so many of you tuned in. But let's talk a little bit about JAK inhibitor therapy and JAK targeted therapy for vitiligo. And we know that the primary cytokine, there's lots of cytokines involved in vitiligo, but the primary cytokine is interferon gamma. And interferon gamma is secreted by CD8 positive T cells. And when those T cells secrete interferon gamma, they stimulate other immune cells to kill the melanocytes. They're, they're, they're destroying them. They're really harming them. And interferon gamma signaling is also then modulated by co-receptor activity with CXCL9 and CXCL10. And how interesting that interferon gamma signals through a variety of JAK stat proteins, but primarily in vitiligo, it signals via JAK1 and 2. And that's where topical ruxolitinib 1.5% cream was formulated as a selective JAK1-2 inhibition molecule that had been studied and subsequently FDA approved for the treatment of vitiligo. And up until 2022, we never had any FDA approved treatments to repigment vitiligo. Interestingly, though, we did have an FDA approved drug up until 2022 for vitiligo in general. But the irony of that is it was monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone, which was FDA approved to depigment vitiligo which was ironically the only FDA approved for this treatment for this disease up until the approval of ruxolitinib cream to repigment vitiligo. And this happened to be a study that was done. This was the phase three study from the 24 week randomized double blinded trials, which I was a part of along with my colleagues. And this was first published at the EADV virtual Congress in 2021. And I'm pleased to say that these results have subsequently been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And these are the results that lead to clinical outcomes like this, 
which is a patient who achieved F Vasi 90 or facial Vasi 90% improvement with monotherapy 1.5% ruxolitinib cream BID. This is an example of a young girl who had periocular and perioral. Imagine how this young girl was probably bullied and the, the questions and the stares. And, you know, a young adolescent child in school should not have to suffer with this. We can improve. Remember what I said, the face is fabulous. And in this study, our subjects could not be on phototherapy. They could not be on antioxidants. They could not be on topical clobetazole, topical triamcinolone, topical tacrolimus, topical pomecrolimus. They couldn't be on any of that. They could only be on active or vehicle. So these are monotherapy robust results. And I will tell you that in my practice now, I use monotherapy ruxolitinib cream all the time. In fact, for me personally, it's become my go-to topical therapeutic option in patients who have vitiligo, and we use it in less than 10% BSA involvement. You can use it monotherapy, and I also personally use it in combination with some of the other things we talked about. Now, of course, that's off-label, but I simply mention that because vitiligo can, in many circumstances, be a disease that requires a polypharmacy approach. This is an example of acral vitiligo. Remember, acral vitiligo can be very challenging, very few hair follicles. There's not a lot of reservoir melanocytes. That's why this disease in this area is an area where we must try to give the patient some hope. And topical jacks like the ruxolitinib cream has certainly been a game changer for me in acral vitiligo. Hasn't worked in everyone, but it does help in cases. An example here showing nice perifollicular repigmentation in the anti-cubital fossae bilaterally, showing really nice results and improvements here, specifically uh, with the t vasi score or the total vasi score. So in this study, the primary efficacy endpoint was an f vasi 75 with 75% 75 improvement. Whereas here now, we see also improvement in truncal or body or extremity areas. And that's how you use that to calculate a T VASI score or a total VASI score. Now, one thing that I will mention with JAK inhibitors is there are black box warnings, even for orals, even for topicals. But what was found is that the vast majority of studies in these, particularly in this pivotal study, there were no clinically significant application site reactions or serious treatment emergent adverse events. Application site acne and pruritus was seen, as was nasopharyngitis, headache, URI, and COVID-19. The study was continued uh, throughout the pandemic. We also uh, saw very few treatment discontinuations due to treatment emergent adverse events. And the ruxolitinib plasma concentration in the TRUVI-1 and TRUVI study was well below the IC50 of JAK2-mediated bone marrow changes. And so the bottom line is limited body surface area. This is not your one pound jar of triamcinolone that you're gonna do wet wraps in. Less than 10% BSA, talking to the patient about what sites they're using it on and talking them through on some of these potential safety related issues is very important. Now, part of the patient experience is ensuring compliance and phototherapy compliance is very, very critical in our understanding of how to manage patients with vitiligo. Now, we use a lot of narrowband UVB and eczema laser in my practice. We do countless numbers of treatments a day using phototherapy, and it's important to set expectations. Phototherapy can be an amazing stabilizing agent like the oral mini pulse steroids. It also can be an amazing repigmenting agent, and we must counsel our patients on the potential that these treatments take time. So what I tell my patients is that expect a 25% improvement after three months, of phototherapy, a 50% improvement after six months, 
of phototherapy, a 75% improvement after nine months of phototherapy. And then this is when you're also combining narrowband with topicals, and that's very, very important. I will also mention that I tell patients, don't even really judge efficacy and outcome until we've done about 48 to 50 treatments, and that's sort of a benchmark. You also wanna make sure you're not underdosing your phototherapy and making sure that our patients really understand that we dose phototherapy. This just happens to be one of the sheets from, from our uh, clinic. This is uh, no endorsement for one brand device or another, but we, we judge based on the patient's skin type, their starting dose. And then if the patient has had mild erythema or has uh, some sort of redness, you need to reduce the dose. But if everything remains normal, you continue to increase the dose by 10 to 15% each session. And then if patients miss sessions, you reduce by half the dose, 25 or hold the dose respectively at the one, two and three week mark. Now, let me briefly in the last couple of minutes mention, patients also ask a lot about vitiligo and COVID. And the bottom line is we don't know how COVID affects vitiligo. We, as a part of the AAD's ad hoc task force on COVID-19, the Academy and the ILDS have put together a COVID-19 cutaneous reactions registry, as well as a vaccination registry. And in there, vitiligo has been reported, but it's hard to know of a true correlation. This is just one study that shows maybe vitiligo actually confers a protective effect for patients from getting severe COVID-19 related uh, uh, responses or those serious COVID-19 infections, potentially due to the interferon gamma cytokine uh, modulating pathway and how that actually affects the uh, sort of a total immune response. So I just thought this was an interesting data that I'll mention because patients will ask and you can say there's some data out there, but it's not been fully elucidated. I also will mention that we do use eczema laser and phototherapy in our pediatric patients, and this has been found to be helpful. This was also published by some of our vitiligo colleagues and experts, and I think this is something we need to think about. Now, in closing, let me just mention that the biggest part of patient experience is to giving patients the understanding that they are not alone, that there's hope on the horizon. This is an exciting time for vitiligo, the most exciting time in my career thus far for vitiligo, and I think there's only so much more to come. And you know, when you have people like uh, Lee Thomas from the Detroit Nightly News going on air and unmasking himself, Winnie Harlow, Michael Jackson, John Hamm from Mad Men, all these people who have embraced their vitiligo and who, who really want to empower and educate I think that now more than ever is the time for, for patients to really understand that vitiligo is something they're not alone with and that people are here to help them with their disease and there's hope on the way. With that, I would like to also encourage you to get involved and tell your patients to get involved with their support groups, particularly the Vit Friends Vitiligo Support Group via the Global Vitiligo Foundation the Skin of Color Society, getting involved in advocacy efforts through the Coalition of Skin Diseases, writing to our elected officials about the need for coverage for vitiligo phototherapy and for treatment options. I think all of these things are just so critically important in our really ability to give our patients that comprehensive approach to their disease. And with that, I'd like to thank the IDEF for the invitation to present tonight. It's been my honor and privilege to share my personal thoughts on vitiligo, some pearls about the patient experience, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Kursik, and hopefully we'll open it up for a little bit of discussion. And first, before we do that, Leon, I think we're going to move into the polling question again. Is that right? Yes, please. So with this polling question, let's go back. And, you know, this is a CME session, and so we want to see how effective uh, some of what I shared was. So prior to 2022, there were no FDA approved treatments for any form of vitiligo, true or false? We'll give everyone a moment to answer that.
okay and let's display the results that is uh, that is interesting that we have a split so prior to 2022 there were fda approved one treatment for vitiligo which was monobenzyl ethereum hydroquinone so the answer to the question is false because there was a treatment before 2022 and uh the roxalitinib was fda approved as a repigmenting agent so i just that's sort of a trick question but an important nuance it's a very tricky question dr desai <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, and it was it was meant that it was meant to really help help us understand that we've never had anything to make this disease better. Uh, we've had things to re even out the skin tone in patients with severe disease, but we haven't had anything to make it better. So let's go ahead and submit your questions on the right hand side of the screen. Dr. Kursik's going to moderate, and I'll turn it back over to you, Leon. Thank you so much. Before we go to the questions, I'd like to thank Insight Dermatology to support this CME program. Uh, and uh, our next actually program is next week on March 14 with another vitiligo patient journey with Dr. Fras Fugier. And then April 18, I call her the queen of vitiligo. Dr. Pearl Grimes is gonna be with us again with her experience. So let's go on and we have some time. Let's go on and look at the um, uh, questions that we have here. So uh, let's see here. Is rixolotinib first line or should be should a patient still try protopic or elidel first? So there's no wrong answer there. I think in my opinion, in my practice now, I am using topical ruxolitinib first line, especially because we now have the FDA approval and the data. And so that to me helps me explain to my patient why I am doing that. Great. Now, the next question is really relevant to everyday practice. Is ruxolitinib, uh, I'm sorry, let's see here. Uh, Ruxolitinib have things changed in terms of accepting vitiligo as a disease by insurance providers? On that note, are treatment options like steroids, phototherapy, laser surgery covered under commercial insurances? So very important question. Short answer is with the FDA approval, in my experience, I have seen coverage that continues to improve for topical ruxolitinib branded formulation. Uh, it can be compounded. The compound is usually not covered and it's much more expensive in my experience. So I have seen coverage really be quite uh, beneficial for my patients. And I've also uh, had very little issue in working with the patient assistance program for those in need. So I've done both of those. In fact, I had a patient today that we filled out the form, we sent it in, and we already got a response back that they're processing it. So uh, I've, I'm sure, Leon, that's been your experience as well. Yeah, mostly, but as you know, the, all those uh, insurance uh, benefits are also very, very local. It can change from place to place. Exactly. Um, so it's hard to say across the board globally, uh, I mean, nationally, what happens. Is ruxolitinib right. cream approved for continuous chronic use for vitiligo? No breaks needed, wants to confirm. Well, so according to the study, we have data and the package insert says use up to 24 weeks and then reassess for response. In my practice, yes, I personally have used it longer than 24 weeks in patients who need therapy and need the treatment. And I think you really need to evaluate patients, take pictures, follow up, talk to them about potential side effects. All of those things are very, very important. Where can, uh, do you do any kind of workup in your new vitiligo patients? I think that's such a relevant question, yeah? Short answer is yes, I do. What I do is uh, the following. I do a TSH and free T4. I do a thyroid peroxidase antibody and I check a vitamin D as well. I think that's very important. Some of my colleagues may de debate that some people check an ANA. I don't usually do that because if it's if it's borderline higher, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, patients already have so many people already have naturally high ANAs. So I don't do that, but I do check for thyroid peroxidase antibodies. And I have found patients 
with normal TSHs and T4s, but high TPO levels who are Hashimoto brewing patients. They haven't manifested yet, but they're getting there and you need to get endocrine on board for those people. That's really a good, um, good explanation. I hate to check ANA too, because I wouldn't know what to do every time if it's a little bit abnormal, right? Right, so, exactly. Um, this is really a, another really good question. What's the best option in the pediatric cases? Well, so one of the best things to do in pediatric cases, phototherapy. Phototherapy, phototherapy, eczema laser. I showed you that paper. There's countless others. Ruxolitinib is FDA approved down to the age of 12. Yep. There's also going to be studies done in ages even younger. So that's, that's very important. Now, I have used topical calcineurin inhibitors off-label in younger children, and I've used them successfully. I've used topical steroids in younger children, and I've used them successfully. Those things are off-label, so I simply want to mention that for your edification to the person who posed the question. Would you ever suggest that patients try home phototherapy devices? Yes, we do lots of home phototherapy, especially in COVID. Patients were mortified that they couldn't come in. In Texas, you know, we had to actually shut down except uh -huh. for life-threatening cases. Uh, and of course, in dermatology, it, we're blessed that we don't have a lot of life-threatening things. In COVID, that was a real challenge. We couldn't even really do much in the office. So home phototherapy, the short answer is yes. There's a variety of different companies that can help with patient assistance. National Biological Corporation and Davlin are two of them. I have no financial interest. I use them both. Uh, patients can buy devices, everything from a hand foot device, tabletop to a seven foot panel. Some people like the handheld ones. I don't see great result from handheld. It's better than nothing, but I would prefer if they would do in office whenever possible. Great, uh, let's see here. Oh, can you sh think, can you show your phototherapy sheet again? Thank you for the excellent presentation. Can we go back and show it maybe and go over it? Yeah, so it's not my photo therapy sheet. It's actually ones particularly from Davlin, but yes, we can go back to that slide and it's it's for my device. So this, what I wanted to show is that there are protocols depending on your device, should be on the next slide. And, and you're welcome to take a look at that, but this is based on my device. You should only use the phototherapy protocol with your specific device, okay? I can't stress that enough. My device, we dose this a certain way. Your device, you may have to dose a different way. Check the output of your bulbs. Make sure that you're following this closely. All of those things are gonna be very, very important. Uh, this is really an interesting question. Why was the study for rixolitinib designed for 24 weeks versus shorter duration? How long does it take to get results? Well, Vitiligo, and they're probably they're probably referring to the atopic dermatitis indication and in data, Leo. Correct. I suspect. But and that's a legitimate question. The bottom line is, what did I say? The patient experience requires us to counsel that this disease takes time. Patients must be patient. We know that vitiligo repigmentation is slower than the reduction in inflammation that we see in AD, just from a physiologic perspective. And that's why this study had a longer design phase. Yeah, I usually tell my patients, you know, this is not gonna, this didn't happen overnight. It's not gonna go away overnight. It takes a lot of, a lot of hand holding, unfortunately. Yes. And when you look at the study results, I think during the open label period from six to 12 months, the numbers almost doubled. Uh, yes. So, so I think it's really important to um, reassure the patient that just it's going to get better. Just hang in there and continue what you're doing. Totally agree. So I think we are at 7.58, almost at 8 o'clock. I apologize. We started a little bit late, but we're going to finish on time. I thank you so much again for joining us, Dr. Desai. I Wish you lots of luck at AAD and for the whole next year as our new leader. And also, I just want to um, 
remind everyone next week we're going to have a similar program with Dr. Fras Rougier. And then in April, we're going to have Dr. Pearl Grimes uh, also telling us her experiences with vitiligo. I thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Bye bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you.